how to pray. For some of us, this is an issue of a New Year's resolution. You get to the start of January, you get to the start of a brand new year, and you think, actually, I, I want to be a better person. You know those resolutions that um, Matt was profiling in the quiz? People saying, I want to live life to the full. I want to help others achieve their dreams. I want to, to, to live well, to be fit, and to be healthy. And if you have any kind of spiritual instinct within you, then you probably think about your spiritual life. You think about your inner life. You think about your soul. And it may be that you're here this evening, like I said earlier, specifically because you've been thinking about faith and you think, well, actually, it's a brand new year. I really should get my faith thing sorted out. And prayer is one of the most fundamental things that we can do when we talk about our own faith and how that works and how that looks. And so we are asking the question today, how to pray. How do we pray? Let me get you to put your hands up if you would like to know how to pray more. Put your hands up if you'd like to know, to be better at prayer, to do prayer more. Okay, now turn to the person next to you and tell them why you want to be better at prayer. And be honest and admit if you only put your hand up because you think that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> Just do that for one second. Why do you want to get better at prayer? Okay, let's get you to the front again. Okay, be honest now. How many of you, put your hand up, if you said that you wanted to get better at prayer because you kind of thought that that was what is expected of you? Put your hand up if that was you. Okay, a couple of honest people. Maybe that's um, all that there is. Maybe the rest of us actually, we want to get better at prayer because we know that there's something there. Listen, this is what I want to, to talk about tonight. One of the weird things about prayer is that Jesus didn't teach his disciples to pray. Jesus didn't teach his disciples to pray. He gathered all these people to follow him, and he started to teach them how to live. He started to shape them and mold them and help them to become the people that they were supposed to be, how to become their very best selves, how to become like them. They were his apprentices. And so he would share with them how to do life and how to follow God and how to serve God. But he never taught them to pray. And then you say, well, yes, he did, Philip, because he taught them the Lord's Prayer. But actually, he didn't teach them to pray until something very special happened. What do you think that thing was? Not that they were baptized. What else might it have been? Pentecost? It's good. It's not right. It's really, really simple. He didn't teach them how to pray until they asked him how to pray. Ah. Revelation. So let's see what that says in the book of Luke. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. In other words, there's no point in me teaching you to pray unless you want to pray. There's no point in Jesus teaching his disciples to pray unless they want to pray. There's no point in anybody trying to give you instruction. There's no point in you even wanting to learn or trying to learn yourself to pray unless you want to pray. The most important thing about learning to pray is wanting to learn how to pray. And there's something about the life of Jesus that he got the fact that he has these people around him, but he can't push this on them. Some people think that to be a Christian, you've just got to do the right things. You've just got to man up, woman up, grit your teeth, go for it, and just do the things that a Christian is supposed to do. It's not going to work. You can't force yourself into this. You can't religion yourself into this. You can't just do a bunch of things and then get into prayer. The only way that you can get more into prayer is if you want to get more into into prayer. It is a hard thing. And I don't want to stand here and tell you a bunch of things and have you, you know, make a little tick box list of things to do if there's nothing in your heart because it won't work. It will be like those fail um, New Year's resolutions that last 
approximately 24 days. It'd be like that. You start off with good intentions, but it won't keep. It, it won't stick. It won't carry on because it's got to be something inside of you. Religion's not going to do it for you. Just, just making yourself do something is not going to do it for you. Being guilted by me or by yourself or by other people or by church, it's not going to do it for you. There's got to be something in you that says, actually, I see something in prayer and I, I want that for myself. And Jesus didn't teach his disciples how to pray until they asked him, how do we pray? And the reason that they asked him is that they saw him praying. Now, in the book of Luke, we see records of Jesus praying all the time, all the time, all the time. He would go to the lonely places to pray. He would spend the night in prayer. He would remove himself from the crowd to pray. He would give himself time and space to pray. And we see this over and over again in Luke. It's, a, it's just a feature of that account of Jesus' life. And the disciples, they saw up close and personal Jesus praying. And when they saw Jesus praying, they saw something powerful happen. They saw that it wasn't just a religious exchange that was going on. It wasn't just mouthing some words. There was something incredible. And when Jesus had been praying, when he'd been in the presence of his father, when he'd come back to them, something was different. They put two and two together. They could tell that the power that he had in his life, the beauty that he had in his personality, was intrinsically tied to prayer. And so they didn't ask him to teach them how to preach. They didn't ask him to teach them how to do miracles. They didn't ask him how to teach them to draw a crowd or lead a movement or be charismatic. They said, the thing we've got to get, how do we pray? So you need a motivation to pray. Otherwise, this is not going to work. Now, you may have the best motivation. The disciples had this motivation is, I want to follow Jesus. And Jesus prays, therefore I must pray. And Jesus was close to God, therefore I want to be close to God. And Jesus had this kind of hotline to heaven, therefore I must have a hotline to heaven. And that, if you have that motivation, that's absolutely fantastic. You can't get better than that. And it may be that for some of you right now, you're reading your Bibles and you're seeing Jesus, you're experiencing him, he's real to you, and you see something in Jesus. You want to be a follower of Jesus, you want to be like him, and that is your motivation. Actually, for others of us, it's because we see it in the lives of others. Now, not next week, but the week after, Rob Scott Cook, who's the, the grand leader, uh, dictator-in-chief uh, of the Woodlands Group of Churches, he set the whole thing up 30-plus years ago. He's coming here. He's going to talk about communion, the Lord's Supper. Now, when you see him pray, you want to pray. I, I've, I've had the privilege of living in his house uh, at various points in my life, also being away uh, on little sort of trips with him. I remember the last time I was away with him, uh, he was in his room. It was early in the morning, and I was kind of creeping past, trying to uh, raid the cornflake cupboard before everyone else got up. And lo and behold, his door was kind of open a, a crack, and I could look in, and I could see Rob Scott Cook in prayer. It was the crazy, crazy sight. Rob Scott Cook, for those of you that don't know him, he looks like the milk tray man. He's kind of got these polar necks and this hair and moustache. And, and there he was. He was knelt down by his bed. And on the bed, sprawled all over the duvet, was paper after paper after paper, files, folders, newspaper clippings. And I know that he spends three hours in prayer every day. I know that he prays to every single person in the Woodlands group of churches. I know that he prays for situations around the world, for churches, for, for governments, for people in authority. He has this most amazing prayer. And when I see him, I want to learn how to pray. I want to be like that because I see someone who's doing something amazing. But it may be that you don't have someone like that. Maybe you're not in one of our home groups yet. Maybe you don't have that many kind of close Christian friends who are a little bit further on from you that are helping you uh, develop your faith. Listen, this is the best thing that I can do for you. And then I'm going to tell you some stuff. The best way that you can get an example to pray is to be your own example. Turn to the person next to you and say, be your own example. <laughs> what I mean by this I will give you the answer that Jesus gave his disciples, and you try this for the next two weeks. You've got this one week, and then we're all doing prayer week together, so we're all doing prayer. And then after the two weeks, if having done this, having given a little bit more time and space and attention and thought to prayer, if you don't feel the difference, give it up. 
But listen, this is my wager. I bet that if you get into prayer and if you do what I'm about to tell you and uh, get into some of the other opportunities that we've got going, after two weeks, you will notice a difference. You will feel closer to God. You'll feel cleaner on the inside. You'll start to th- see things differently and, and impact differently in your workplace, with your relationships, in your family, in your home. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. And when that happens, then something within us says, oh, I want to learn how to pray more. But before I go on and explain what Jesus said, I just want to give you a little proviso, and that's this. Our vision as Metro is to help people find Jesus, follow Jesus, love one another, and serve their city. That's the icons that we have on the T-shirt. But this thing that I'm about to tell you, it's seriously supposed to be for those that want to follow Jesus. To follow Jesus means to become like him. You see, some people, they go into faith and they find Jesus. They get an answer. They think, yeah, I found Jesus. I found the church. I've got some answers. I feel good about myself. I feel like I know where I'm going to go when I die. And that is where it stops. And you can be a Christian and you've found Jesus and you can pray however you want to pray. Knock yourself out. Enjoy yourself. But the prayer that Jesus told his disciples were for people who specifically wanted to follow him. So this is a follower's prayer. Let's look at the passage again. It says, when Jesus was praying in a certain place, when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Disciples, disciples, disciples. A disciple is someone who is following Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. I don't want to just have my own little relationship with God on my terms. I want to make him Lord. I want to make him in charge. I want to do what he wants me to do. And so it then says that Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, and then he does the Lord's Prayer. Now, how many of you put your hands up if you know the Lord's Prayer? Okay, how many of you learned it at school out of curiosity? How many of you didn't learn it at school but have picked it up somewhere else? Okay, I'm going to test you. Let's do it together. Together? Our Father, oh, old fashioned version, because that's easier. <laughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Amen. Give yourselves a round of applause. Okay, now this is how Luke records it. And I want you to see something. You're going to see that it's a little bit different. He says this. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. That's it. Just two verses. Um, Now, here's a little question. How many times in the Bible does the Bible record that the early church or the disciples used this prayer? How many times? Not at all. Zero. Zip. Nada. Zilch. The big fat nothing. There's no time in the Bible where you hear that the church got together and they prayed, Our Father who art in heaven. Why is it not there? If this is the answer to the prayer... That the disciples of ours, if this is the Lord's prayer, then why don't they pray it? I'll tell you why. You've got to understand what Jesus is saying here, what Jesus is doing here. And the best way that I can explain it is by comparing it to Singsbury's local. (laughs) This was in the news recently. Singsbury's got a little bit huffy with uh, Mr. Sing from, uh, I think it was Armandsbury. Uh, who made his shop Singsbury's Local. Uh, I think it's perfectly reasonable. But basically, the, the Sainsbury's people weren't happy. But essentially, what we're talking about... We, you can take that off, it's too dis- distracting. <laughs> what we're talking about is we're talking about the experience that you have when you go to a Sainsbury's or a Tesco's or whatever supermarket of choice, Waitrose. Uh, when you go into these places, they are set up Always, no matter if it's a highbrow or whether it's a little, uh, they are actually maybe little is a little bit different. I don't know. I don't go. Um, <laughs> but um, they have a particular way. There's a psychology about it, but basically, what they do is they arrange the supermarket in sections. 
So you go in and it is groceries. And then when you've moved through groceries, it is meat. And then when you've moved through meat, it is cereal. And when you've moved through cereal, it is drinks. And when you've moved through drinks, it's dessert. And so anybody on any trip to any supermarket, whether it's a a local one, a metro one, or whether it's one of these big warehouse superstores, they know that there's a basic system that you go around and it helps you remember what you want to get. So you go in and you think, okay, my groceries, what vegetables do I need? What uh, rice and potatoes and salads do I need? And then I go to the meat section and, and maybe dairy is there as well. And I can spend a long time in each of these sections, but I know that once this section is done, I then move to the next section. And I may just have a a short time in this next section, but I go on to the next section. What drinks do I need? And then the good stuff, desserts, snacks, sweets, puddings, chocolate. We go into that section and uh, we just have at it. Because basically the, the whole way that a supermarket is set up is that there is a pattern of movement. There's a pattern that this thing is set out to help us get the maximum so that I can always kind of go through in a logical way. And I am free to blast through in five minutes just picking up one item from each section. Or I can spend a whole hour in there filling up a massive trolley with loads of different things and all the various different aisles in each of the different sections. But I know that any given supermarket, I'm going to walk in and first of all there's going to be the groceries and then I'm going to go to the meat. I've got the idea of how to do a shop. So what Jesus is doing is he's giving you a Singsbury's local shopping plan. A kind of, it's a pattern prayer. It's a pattern prayer. And what it does is it breaks it down into different sections. And you know that you can spend as long or as little on each section as you want. This makes sense. And so the sections are, Our Father... Hallowed be your name. Then your kingdom come. Then give us each day our daily bread. And then forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. So there's a four different sections. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day. Forgive us our sins. And if you think about that as moving through, when you pray, and I try and make it as simple as I can without being simplistic, but this is basically what Jesus was getting at. You spend time in each of the areas. You spend time in each of the sections. And it could be a long time or it could be a little time. But that way you know that you're going on a little bit of a journey of prayer. And when you get out of the end, you've got a a really balanced life. You've got the kind of a full shopping load. You've done well with prayer. You've, You've actually covered all the bases. And prayer has actually had its impact on you. I want to go through each of these sections and tell you what they mean and how they work. But before I do that, I just want you to know one really simple thing. And you don't know this. In fact, just jig the person next to you and say, we're about to learn something we don't know. And then say to them, actually, I probably do know this because I'm like a Bible (laughs) guru. Okay, this is the thing. This is the most important thing that Jesus does when he talks about prayer. Because here's the fact. When the disciples say, teach us how to pray, they knew how to pray. A good Jewish boys. Every good Jewish boy in the first century knows how to pray. They pray every day. They have the, the shame up. You know, um, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then they would pray. In fact, the devout Jews would pray three times a day. Uh, they would pray at sunrise, then they would pray around about 3 p.m., then they would pray at sunset. And they had different prayers, they had different forms, and they were done in Hebrew. Hebrew, for the Jews at that time, was your kind of classical language. You know, it's like when we talk about the Lord's Prayer with the these and the thous. Well, that was what Hebrew was for them. It was their classical language. It was how they prayed. And if you wanted to pray, you'd use special religious language, special old words, special system, special recitals, and you do it all. But when Jesus says, this is how I want you to pray, he says, okay, this is how you pray. And he starts speaking. This is the bit. Ready? Here it comes. Lean in. He starts speaking, not in Hebrew, not in classical language, not in religious words, in Aramaic. Aramaic, the street language. Aramaic, the language of the people. Aramaic, the normal language, the language that you use with your mates. And he just goes, and the first word, the best Aramaic word of them all, Abba. 
You see, the first word that kids, even to this day in Syria and Jordan, it's the first word that a kid will learn. Abba. It means daddy. Abba, our father. And he says, listen, when you pray, you don't use special language. You don't get all religious. You don't scrunch up and try to do something crazy and, and pious and holy. Just be yourself. Just talk like you talk to your mates. But actually, let's look at the first section. The first section, it's Abba, Father. Father, hallowed be your name. In other words, in this section, it's all about Father God. And what he's saying is this. The first thing that you do when you pray is that you remind yourself that God is your Father. He loves you. Now, for some of us, this is a little bit difficult to hear because you may not have had the greatest relationship with your dad Maybe you had an absent father. Maybe you had an abusive father. Maybe you had a difficult relationship with your father. No father in human terms is perfect. I speak as a father. And for some of you, this might be a difficult one to get over. But it's almost like Jesus wants to re-educate us to think about a perfect father. Abba. Abba. The one that we can be dependent upon. And when I pray, I spend the first bit of time thinking about God. He's my Father. If you could just find a little time to pray, maybe first thing in the morning, that's usually the best when we want to give it the best of our time. Well, Whenever it is for you, whether it's the car on the way to work, whether it's last thing at night, whether it's when you walk, when you're doing your your lunch break, but you find some time. The first thing you do is you're, you're there. God, you're my Father. I can trust you. I can depend on you. And God is revealed as Father. Jesus talked about it an awful lot. He said, you know, this is the Father that cares for you, loves you, wants the best for you, has got your back, always believes the best in you. This is the one that you can trust. He's not remote. He's not aloof. He's not just distant from you. He's the one that wants to cradle you in his arms. And when we pray, we remind ourselves, God is my Father. But we say, God, Father, Abba, Daddy, hallowed is your name. Holy. Which is so weird. So weird. Because it's like Jesus is saying two different things at the same time. One, he's your father, he's close. But two, he's holy. Holy means set apart, separate, awesome, unlike normal things. Special, different, other, ethereal. It means out there, God. And so when I pray, I spend time holding these two things together, these two truths, that God is my loving Father, and yet He's so much above everything that I can think or imagine. He's on a different plane of existence, that He is so much greater than anything this universe could ever have to offer or experience. And that gives me that sort of confidence that He is my close Father who wants to be intimate with me, and He is powerful and he is holy and he is precious and he is good and it allows me to have a reverence for God and an awe for God and yet an intimacy with God there's no better way to have a relationship with God than to know that he loves you that he cares you that you have absolute access to him and yet he is great he is magnificent he is awesome he is holy he is wonderful and if he is wonderful and holy and powerful then he can do great things in my life and great things in my relationship and great things in my world and and with my prayer my relationship with him he is powerful and awesome so the first thing that you do when you pray you spend a little bit of time and you just concentrate on the fact that God is your father but is also holy now you might want to do that by listening to worship songs you might want to do that by reading the Bible and thinking about what it says about God or you might just want to do that in in silent contemplation thinking God I thank you that you're my father God I thank you that you're holy God I thank you that you're so close to me God I thank you that you're so powerful And as we spend time like that, we begin to find ourselves changed. Now, the second thing, it goes on, your kingdom come. This is why I say it's a disciple's prayer. Because so many people, when they pray, it's all about, dear God, bless me. Dear God, these are my needs. In fact, you don't even pray unless you've got something that you need from God, right? If you're not very close to God, then you'll just pray when you want something and when you need a little bit of help from the man upstairs. But Jesus says, the disciples' prayer, the followers of Jesus' prayer, that's a prayer that says, I know who you are, God, and I know who I am in relationship with you. Now I want your kingdom to come. 
I want your will to be done. I want to be on a mission with you, Jesus. I don't want to just be a consumer of faith. I want to be a person who is on an adventure with God. Definite charis, the best phrase of the evening. What a brilliant way to kick off 2017 on an adventure with God. And so disciples, followers of Jesus, we say, I'm on an adventure with God. And I want to pray and I want to add my say-so to God's say-so that we would see his kingdom come. His will be done. And so we pray for his kingdom. The best way I can explain this is Super Mario Run. I got Super Mario Run on my iPhone over Christmas. Has anyone been playing Super Mario Run? Okay, just Ruben. Me and Ruben, we've been playing Super Mario Run on our phones. And it is it's quite something. It's a surreal game. Now, I never had a Nintendo before. Never had a Game Boy. Never played Mario. Didn't even know who Mario was, let alone that he had a little pet dinosaur. <laughs> Yoshi. Very good. But what I discovered is Mario is an ab- Mario is an absolute genius when it comes to Kingdom theology. Mario knows all about kingdom theology. If you've ever played Mario, you'll know what I mean. Mario has himself, as he's going through these different kingdoms and these different lands, and he has this uh, enemy, this sort of, I don't know, weird, again, it looks like a dinosaur, big, muscular, Bowser, is it? Bowser. And Bowser captures Princess Peach, and I realize that I sound like an idiot as I'm saying this, but he takes her off into his castle. And, and basically what you do is you go through these different worlds. They're called worlds. They're called different levels. And on these different, you know, some of them are set in the sky. Some of them are underground. Some of them are on the ground. Some of them are in doors. Some of them are outside. But you go through each one of these, and you have to overcome obstacles. And at the end of the thing, you capture the territory back away from the evil Bowser. It's so amazing. What he does is he jumps up onto a flagpole and he pulls down the... Has anyone... If if you've seen this at all... He pulls down the flag of the bad guy and he puts his own flag there and says, now this is territory that belongs to Mario. Super Mario. This is great. Fantastic. (laughs) Now, it's a great image. It's a great picture. If it doesn't work for you, then go buy the app. Um, But essentially, uh, essentially, it's saying you go through different levels, different parts of life, and you see the territory that is now captured and annexed by evil, and you take hold of it for God. And in prayer, what we're doing is we're walking through the different avenues and the different levels and the different areas, the different worlds that we inhabit. And we're saying, we want this area to no longer belong to evil, where goodness has been held ransom, where the hearts and lives and futures of people have been captured and held hostage where they have been repressed and chained and bound up. We want this to be territory where God is. And so I pray, I pray, God, let your kingdom come. I want to put a flag up for Jesus Christ in the area of finance. I want to put a flag up for Jesus Christ in the area of politics. I want to put a flag up for Jesus Christ in the area of healthcare, in the areas of community, in the areas of the vulnerable and the homeless, the addicted and the marginalized. I want to put a flag down in the place where I work. I want to put a flag down in my university, in my school, in my college, in my street, in art, in expression, in entertainment, in every sphere and aspect. I want to go through all of those different levels and I want to go through all of those different worlds and I want to see God's flag being raised. So when we pray, we go on a journey of prayer. We say, God, I want to see your kingdom come where I'm working. God, would your kingdom come in the way that I am a boss to my uh, employees? Or may your kingdom come in the way that I am a citizen of this city and, and I contribute to the community that I'm a part of. I want to see the kingdom of God coming in my family, my extended family. I want to see the kingdom of God coming in every area and element of my life. And so when we pray, first of all, we pray about our relationship with God. And then we pray about the world that we inhabit. And then thirdly, he says, give us each day our daily bread. This is where we pray for our needs. 
And essentially, this is where I say, God, these are the issues that I have. It may not be literal bread, but it's most likely to be, I've got a need. Maybe it's a financial need. Maybe it's a need for help at work. Maybe it's the course that I'm doing. But I want to pray and bring my needs to God. And then the final one, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. And here we're talking about our wholeness, my wholeness. In other words, I come to God, and it's weird, it's so significant, that this is the last thing that Jesus tells us to do. Right now, now is when I ask for God to forgive me. It's not like I have to come to God and the first thing that I've got to do is throw myself onto my knees and grovel and snivel before him because I am just a rotten sinner. He says, look, come before me and let me know. Let, I want you to know me as Father. And then bring me into every area of the world that you touch. And then ask me to supply the needs that you have. And that's where we get the word supplication, which is our sort of title for the detox today. Supplication, supply my needs. And then... Then let's deal with the dirt inside of you. Forgive me my sins as I forgive those that sin against me. And don't just forgive me for my sins. Help me not to sin in the first place. Lead me not into temptation. You may struggle with pornography. You may struggle with over consumption of alcohol. You may struggle with um, losing your temper. You may struggle with uh, having a bad attitude at work. You may struggle with, with gossip or backbiting and all these different ugly things about you. And you say, God, I don't want to just be forgiven for when I do them and make mistakes. I want you to help me not do them in the first place. I want to be whole. And so the, you've got four simple ways in which we pray. First of all, we pray about Father God. Secondly, we pray about his kingdom, his will. Then we pray about the needs that we have. And we want to consciously make sure that we're living lives on the edge. If you don't need to pray and ask God to supply your needs, you're not giving enough. Give more. Sacrifice more. Give to others. And then ask God to supply your needs. It's a better way to live rather than just storing and hoarding everything for your own consumption. And then finally, God, I want you to make me whole. Because you're holy, your name is hallowed, and I want to be holy too. I want to be like you. So this is our big idea. Disciples of Jesus learn to pray through this pattern. Just repeat it with me. Father God and his kingdom first, then my needs and my wholeness in turn. Let's do that bit again. Father God and his kingdom first, then my needs and my wholeness in turn. So here's a little practical way that you can actually do this. Say you've got 15 minutes. First of all, spend a couple of minutes just thanking God that he's your father. And then take a couple of moments, maybe just one minute, in silent contemplation and think, God, you are holy. And think about God's awesomeness, his greatness, his power. And then why not go on and take, say, three or four minutes and begin to pray about the areas where you want to see God's kingdom come. It might be someone that you know that is sick. And we pray for God's kingdom. We pray that they be healed. It may be people that you know that are, uh, are suffering, that they're struggling, that they're depressed or they're bereaved or they're hopeless or they're addicted it may be that you want to pray about the specific areas that you're involved in. We pray about our city. We pray about our country. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the workplace. We pray for our universities. We pray for areas. We, we think of ourselves as Super Mario running through these different areas of, of life. And, and instead of eating mushrooms or whatever he does, we're praying prayers. We're praying the kingdom of God to come. And then we take just, I don't know, two, three minutes to ask God, these are the needs that I have. These are the challenges in my day. These are the things that I'm facing right now. Pray about those things. And actually, when you do all of these things, when you've got to one section, why not just take a little bit of a time, you know, a minute, just to be quiet and say, what else do you want to lead me into prayer, Lord God? What are the needs do I have? Or what other areas are there that you want to see your kingdom come? How can I do that? And then finally, just come before God and pray. Ask him for forgiveness. If you can't think of anything, again, just take a couple of moments. Take 30 seconds and say, Holy Spirit, would you show me areas where I have let you down, where I have not lived up to your calling on my life? 
And then you may think about the day that you've had or the, the week that you've had and the people that you may have inadvertently offended or advertently offended. And then you ask God, forgive me, cleanse me, change me. And then you think about those areas. You think about those, the, the, those areas where there's stuff on the internet that you really shouldn't be filling your head with or, or stuff that you shouldn't really be filling your body with. And you pray, Lord God, keep me away from temptation. Help me not to go there. Help me not to even be tempted because I feel so whole on the inside. And then you can do what the early church did, which is they added their own bit. For thine is the kingdom. Thine is the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'll tell you this, and then we're going to pray. The times that I have felt closest to God is when I have been praying on my own. If you think that the best place to be close to God is church, you're half right. This is a great place to connect with God and his people. But I tell you, the way that you're going to be most connected to God's spirit and most alive with his presence and his power is when it's just you with Abba, Father. And as you begin to cultivate that, then something happens on the inside. And you think, gosh, I know it's a struggle and it's always going to be a struggle, but I want to push into this. I want to get better at this. I want to learn how to pray. Let's pray right now. Lord God, I thank you for this wonderful privilege, this gift of prayer. I thank you that the God who is holy above all, King of the universe, has allowed us to approach with confidence and call you Daddy. I pray that you would teach us to pray just as you taught your disciples. I pray for those of us that are struggling with faith that still feel like we're, we've just got such a lot of ground to make up. I want to pray that you'd help us. I want to pray that no matter where we are, we would each start reaching out to you and devoting time to pray. I want to pray that these little prayer cards that we've got and the next week's opportunities with prayer week, I want to pray that these things would help us to pray. Would you support us? Would you strengthen us? Would you inspire us? And would you fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we could be men and women who follow Jesus and learn how to pray in the precious, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.